everybody. Happy Wednesday. It's great to be here. I'm missing my sidekick. Um, I am a kick without a side. Um, Meg is off on her honeymoon as of today. So off she goes. Um, I'm on my own. In fact, even Shelly, um, who is normally joining me, uh, us, I should say, digitally, um, is getting Meg to the air, Meg and family to the airport. So she's not going on the honeymoon with uh, with her family, but her kids are going to Arizona while she's going to Belize. It's very complicated. Um, but uh, so Shelly is um, saving her a ridiculous airport parking bill. So anyway, she's headed that way. So um, thank you for being here. And I'm excited to go it alone for a couple of weeks without Meg and immediately upon her return I am turning around and leaving for a week so it's gonna be <laughs> gonna be a kind of crazy February um we've got lots of things going on the rest of the year though so it seems like the right time um to be doing the things um, I will not be going to Belize um I have a surprise trip that my boyfriend has scheduled thanks Cappy and I'm super excited I don't know anything about it I'm just gonna get in the car and drive away well, he's going to drive because he knows where he's going, but I'm just going to drive. So it's going to be super fun. So thanks for being here. Um, I've got uh, Shelly's announcements because she's awesome that way. And uh, one of the things that's going on today is I'm doing a live out on Clubhouse. And cl the cool thing about Clubhouse is that it's a live interaction. It's all audio. There's no video. There's no chat. So you can't have like a side conversation going. Um, that's good and bad in a lot of ways. But today's um title today's topic is the fog of change uh, secrets to thriving so um, i'm going to give you a little bit of a hint about what that looks like so what how clubhouse works is you get out there and you um there's called things called rooms and you go to the room you want and then you get to introduce your, it depends how big like if there's a small group you get to introduce yourself you get to kind of talk about the topic um, if it's a huge room, then the moderators ask you to raise your hand and then you get, you can ask a question and then you go back down to the audience. So um, in our clubhouse, uh, because we're, I'm just learning and I only have like 40 followers, it'll probably be pretty small, maybe just a handful of people. And uh, props out to Ashley Smith at Social Jargon. She's been out there a lot. She's been really supportive. She's been doing her own rooms. Um, hopefully she'll be there with me. So at least I won't be by myself. So come on out if you want to be invited. So the tricky thing about Clubhouse is you have to be invited to show up and attend. So um, it's also iPhone only right now. So um, if you want to go, I actually have one more invitation left. I um, just gave one away to someone on LinkedIn. So if you would like one, uh, an invitation, let us know. PM um, the Facebook page here and we will get you one. Um, all right, so the topic, the fog of change, and one of, um, so we're going to talk about secrets. So we're going to invite you to share your, your secrets, if you like, for the things, ways that you've learned about dealing with change. Um, but I have four secrets that I'm going to be sharing. So if you would like to know them, uh, come on out and join us. Um, I might do a live later this week on Facebook to share some of the lessons we learned there and um, to connect you with some of those things. All right, so that's right away, right after this, not right after this, because it's at like three o'clock mountain time. So I'll have a little bit of a break between this and that one to get some a drink and a snack. And um, then I'll meet you back up there. All right, um, so please, I'd like you to invite you to listen to our newest How the Hell show. Um, Brian Lasseter was um, a guest. He's who's highlighted this week. If you don't know how the hell show, um, it is basically an opportunity for individuals to tell us a singular story about something that happened in their life where they kind of looked up and looked around and went, how the hell did I get here? Uh, whether it has to do with ugly crying or it's a really fun and delightful story. Uh, Brian's is uh, interesting in the in the way of um, how he found himself working for free. So it's a it's a good story and very interesting. We also tie it into how we are wired to work, and that can be really insightful for people. Um, so check that out. So our weekly quote 
is values are a compass rose. Uh, they direct you to your desired outcome by orienting your daily routine to your big picture. So uh, talking about values today, it's on page 140 of our book. Um, our weekly writing prompt is, are your core values up to date? Um, now, uh, some of times our core values don't change. Um, and there's probably some that are consistent throughout your whole life. But there are some, especially those four, three, four, five ones that can change priority. You can add, like, let's say um, you have, uh, maybe after coronavirus, your experience with coronavirus, you value family more, or maybe you value your freedom more. Maybe you value travel even more than you thought you did. So sometimes our experiences can bring light changes. And so make sure that your values and how you're orienting your day-to-day -day life aligns with those values. Um, I would say uh, you should put your values in the comments if um, something springs to mind. Um, let's see, um, do you live on them by a daily basis? So be sure to reflect and think about exactly what they mean to you. And make sure you have them on paper. So what's one thing we've really learned around here is writing down things makes a big, big difference. So I challenge you to write your values down. Um, <coughs> excuse me. My values are definitely around family, around friendships, around freedom, and around travel. And those are my, and really at the, my core, I have a really big, one of my core values is liminality, which liminal means transitions or, and sometimes it's used in death in the space between being alive and being dead. Um, it's rep, often represented with uncertainty or unknowing or tra like, there, like there's some kind of transition. And I love living in that kind of space. That's one of the reasons I love travel. I like going to places I don't know, learning them. Um, that moment where you come around a corner and you think, I've seen that chicken before and it feels familiar. I always use the chicken because when we were in um, Malaga in Spain, um, we rented an apartment with my family. It was me, my daughter, Alex, and my parents. And we had an apartment in this pedestrianized part of Malaga. So the old city um, isn't big enough for traffic. The, the streets aren't big enough for traffic. So um, we rented this uh, apartment in this part of town. And so then you had to walk everywhere. And we parked our car like in the parking deck, kind of a half a mile away on the outside of Old Town. And then you had to walk in. So um, anyway, right down the street from us was the chicken broaster and it had this funny cartoon chicken on it. And so whenever you thought you might be close to the apartment, you would see this cartoon chicken. So um, we actually went down and got a chicken once in a while from the broaster. So we had a really, really fantastic trip. And we always knew when we saw the chicken, we were close to home. So. That is a part of my um, core value proposition. And so be sure that on a day-to-day -day basis, you understand your values and what direction you're going in. I guess I'll, I'll share a, a less exciting or, or a little more tragic value story. I was just speaking with someone who has, been, who has an employee who stole from her and um, she really felt like she had shared values with this person. And you could tell that, that the owner of the company felt very um, um, the word is escaping. I want to say violated, but that's not quite right. Uh, betrayed maybe is a better word. Really betrayed by this person because she trusted in her and she really felt like they had an understanding and they shared values. So values can also um, help anchor you when times are tough too. So values are always good to have at the ready. Okay, so IX Leadership member questions. Um, my current employer has offered to pay for me to get my PMP certification. So for those of you who aren't sure what that is, is a project management professional certification. Um, it is one of the hardest professional certifications to get. That's what I hear. I've only taken one. I've only taken one. So hard to know, but uh, that's the, the rumor. Um, very challenging. A very technical, uh, lots of details and um, terminology and process understanding. And there's 10 areas of, um, there's 10 knowledge areas. So you're, you have, you're supposed to know a little bit about all 10 areas. 
So the question is, any tips or tricks to successfully getting through the process and exam? Boy, let me tell you, um, you got to do it in a short amount of time. If you say, well, I'm going to take it in September and it's now February, uh, yet you won't actually study until freaking August anyway. So what I would recommend is take a class that will a test prep class. So they do have test prep classes. They're usually a couple grand. Um, you can take one on, you can take them online now. So take your test prep class. And what I did is I scheduled my test three weeks after my class was over before I even took the class because you have to schedule it. You have to have it proctored. You have to be somewhere. Make sure you can take the test because of COVID. There might be some testing areas that are shut down. So um, do the test prep and then study, 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 study for three weeks and then take it. And so the way that I studied for the test is I did test uh, questions. I did sample like um, practice test questions because a lot of it is to really being successful is to, um, is to get familiar with how they ask questions, the kind of formulas you need to memorize, um, the kinds of ways that they ask, like what's the best answer to this question? And you might have a couple right answers, but what's the best? Um, and then what, what a lot of the online test prep uh, questions uh, that you can get, they actually tell you the, um, where you got wrong, like what areas you got wrong, because that you're actually tested in five different process areas. And so then you can, it helps you focus on where you should study. Because frankly, if you get 95% on, on the first section, then don't study, don't waste time studying that. Study the piece that you're having trouble with. Um, I will plug, um, I think the week of like March 9th or something, like the second full week of March, um, we're doing a project management series of classes at uh, Black Hill State University, um, Rapid City. So if you are from the region and you're interested in taking classes, we do those two classes will also help you study. So we have um, project management training camp for the first two days of the week. And then the last three days of the week, we have guiding organizational change. It's also a project management based class, but it focuses more on dealing with people and guiding people through change because that's really, let's be honest, the hardest parts of our job. So, um, so I invite you to check that out if you're interested. Um, all right. Um, I threatened myself with a career change several times in 2020 and kept coming up with reasons to put it off. I feel I'm no longer a good fit for my role and that my work environment is toxic. Gross. My family and friends are tired of hearing me complain about my current position. <laughs> what are the first steps I should take to hold myself accountable and move forward? Well, um, it's a little, this is a tough one because they're so, moving through change is quite challenging for most people. So there's a couple ways to think about it. One, you have to really be able to see where you're going to feel comfortable leaving. Um, some people that are very, very chaos tolerant, they can just go. But that's pretty rare. I'm really chaos tolerant and even I really struggle with that kind of thing because your job is so much about not only your job, but it's also about financial stability, taking care of people you love, um, being financially okay, doing things that you like if you don't have a family, like travel or whatever your magic is, philanthropy. Um, so there's actually a lot going on when you think about changing careers. So what I would encourage you to do is really look around at options because I think if you look around at options and you can see yourself, like let's say there's another company in the area or another kind of job that you're looking for um, that makes sense and that you can make, okay, well, I, that sounds like a good job. I could make the monies, I could live off the money. Um, it's near my house right now or, and that sort of thing. Because I think a lot of reasons that people don't take the leap is because they can't really see themselves in the future. And that's really, really hard for most people. Um, like I said, it's hard for me and, um, and I'm really chaos tolerant. And the other thing is that it often takes about a year to really, like if you're gonna do a major, major change, not just like go from 
uh, it's sort of a trivial example, but go from like a Burger King to a McDonald's, right? Kind of the same job, you know, kind of the same pay, like no big deal. But if you really like are gonna really do a major change, like quit your job and live in a van, or um, I like how that's a, a good thing now, by the way. When I was a kid, like quitting your job and living in a van was like really not a good idea. That was like not looked upon favorably. <laughs> But if you want to go do hashtag van life or some of those really dramatic life changes, those take about a year of thinking and process, at least a year for um, more K, more order tolerant people, it might take even longer. So I guess the first thing I would do is don't beat yourself up about it. Um, the second thing I'd say is stop bitching. If, you, if you're not ready to do something about it, then just don't complain about it all the time. Um, but sometimes talking out loud about things is how we process better. So if it's a matter of you want to talk about what might happen or what's going on, talk about the possibilities, ask questions about, Hey, what do you think? Do you think I'd be good at this job or what jobs do you think I'd be good at? Or what do you think my priorities are? Or we have a, a friend of ours who is thinking about uh, quitting her job and she reached out to some friends and said, Hey, will you help me? put my resume together. So make sure it looks good. Can you maybe write parts of my resume? Um, I'll look at it and you guys can reflect. We can practice interviews. You can help me look at job titles. So she made it kind of a group effort. And so that can be really fun. And she's really finding that helps also keep her accountable. So there's a lot of ways that you can move yourself forward. You don't have to go from nothing to everything. You can look around, evaluate your choices, and then decide not to do it. I do that all the time. Um, Cappy and I, my boyfriend, we do, we think about all kinds of crazy things and we sketch it out. Sometimes we spend a lot of money doing it and then we decide, yeah, this is actually not going to work for us. So, um, and sometimes we just sketch it out, do the spreadsheets and then we go, oh yeah, there's no way we could survive with a bagel shop because <laughs> I would really love uh, to have a bagels, real bagels in Spearfish, by the way, green bean. Um, you guys make donuts. I bet you could do bagels. Oh, that'd be amazing. Um, so anyway, I can't, we just didn't pencil. Like the number of bagels I'd have to sell as a standalone business would just never make the money. So um, I didn't do it. So it's, it's a nice way to imagine yourself in a new space without actually committing uh, your financial well-being to do it. Another just piece of advice I would give, there's a lot of people I know that think about, well, I want to get into this gig economy thing. I want to take everything I've learned and become a coach or become a mm, consultant or that's some of those things. And I can tell you from personal experience as well as from other people that I've talked to and worked with is that often it's the baby steps that get you started. So instead of just quitting your job and going full force, um, take, a, take a small job on the side and set up your checking accounts, get your tax ID numbers in order. Um, just give it a try, like build up your confidence about doing that. And once you get that going, then when you're ready to leave, you actually can just step into that a little more easily. My experience was um, I was doing some consulting on the side and then I got fired. So when I got fired, <laughs> Then I um, decided that I was going to go do consulting full time. And getting fired is a real kick in the teeth. And I don't care what the circumstances are. I had a very sort of legitimate firing in the sense of I was working for um, a former president of a university. And then we had a new president come in. And then so they oh, usually turn the staff over and bring their own people in. Or, or choose their own people. So often that's just what happens when we get a new president and just like the White House. And so I was part of the staff that got let go, um, but it still sucks. And I still didn't, uh, I still had a terrifying, ugly crying moments about how I was gonna make it. And, um, and so it just, it helped tremendously that I had um, already um, a little bit of consulting experience. And then as I was really lucky, I got about six months notice before my contract expired. So I could then work on, on my off time on the nights and weekends building up, like how was I gonna actually make this work? I could apply for jobs, I could apply for grants, I could do, I did a lot of stuff to kind of set myself up. So that is for sure uh, what I would do if I were you um, regarding 
thinking about, if you, that's kind of the way that you're thinking about going, start small. And we've actually talked about to several other people, mostly women in this that are coming to mind, who started small and then were able to go on full-time to, to be consultants full-time. All right, um, some good news. So this is a fantastic story. So I'm gonna, I'm not sure if Shelly is on because she, you said was running Meg to the airport. So I'm gonna post it, that way you guys can check it out while you're listening. So this is a great story. So this is a Chick-fil-A in Hawaii. So a Chick-fil-A in Hawaii, they, um, for their annual party, um, they had a raffle for a car. So they had a bunch of raffly things. She had five tickets, or this one gal had five tickets, depending on how many hours she'd worked that year. And you could put your raffle tickets into any of these buckets you wanted, but you could only put one ticket into the car bucket. And so they had a group of friends and then one friend who lived pretty far away from Chick-fil-A, but she was biking in all winter. And so, yeah, winter in Hawaii is not as bad as winter here. It is like minus 12 is the high for Saturday here. But they said, you know what? All their friends got together and said, if any of us win this car, we are giving it to this gal. And I forget her name. And so, um, so when they went to draw for the car, um, this girl's best friend got the, got the car. She immediately gave it to her best friend um, who thought it was amazing. Um, the funny part of the story, I think, is that of course my first reaction was if my kid gave a brand new car away, I'd be like, what the hell are you doing? Um, but uh, what happened was um, because she was still paying on payments on her own car. So uh, what happened was this, the gal that gave away the car, her aunt did a little bit of a fundraiser and helped pay off her car. So now they have two cars both paid off. And uh, the one gal said her mom was a little mad about her giving away a brand new car, but she had no regrets and she's just really happy. And it's a really, really lovely story. You should definitely check it out. It's very heartwarming and uh, thank goodness for good friends, especially these days. So um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I think that's it for the day. We always end with good news because we always want to send you off with a warm and fuzzy feeling. I mean, hanging out with us is always warm and fuzzy, but um, that's is especially nice. So thanks for being here. Well, since Meg's not here, I'll just have to say her bit, which is lead powerfully. And I always say change the world. So go get them, everybody. We'll see you here next week. Great to see you. Mwah.